none of you in this ring will ever Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And, you know, a lot of things have been changing in the industry. We've been trying to cover everything. But today I want to take a, a bigger look and maybe talk about why comic books and how comic books will never be the same again. And today to talk with me about or talk with me about this is my good friend, Perch. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Always good to talk to you this morning on, on both shows. So, you know, like I said, comic books were never going to be the same again. We knew this kind of coming into this. All of a sudden, um, Diamonds halts distribution. DC and Marvel and then Image all fall, so followed suit as far as, as digital distribution goes as well. They halted digital because they didn't want to create the logistical nightmare. Uh, we've seen some publishers are still doing, you know, some graphic novels and things like that. But we're starting to see this change that we've been expecting you know, I've, I've said uh, multiple times, I think there are going to be years worth of market evolution con consolidated into a few months. Of course, the biggest one being uh, it now looks like there's two new national distributors to compete with Diamond Comics, uh, U UCS uh, distribution and Lunar distribution. Is this a temporary strategy? Is this a long term fix? No, I think it's a long term fix unless it fails. Um, unless the one or both of these entities just can't make it work, it just it's not business viable. But I think we're in it for, I mean, it's it's going to be a year minimum of them trying this out, pushing this stuff forward, and and I, I mean, based on the needs of the industry, I think there's no reason why it won't succeed and why it won't continue and why this uh, this won't expand further. They need to find a national uh, partner to go along with this. So two is going to need to become three or maybe even four. Um, I think that. It's, you know, the comic industry will never be the same again, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, some, some are saying it, it, you know, this is, this is bad that we're, that it's, it's changing, but it's actually good that it's changing. It's needed to change. And these are positive uh, developments. I completely agree with you. This, it was a stagnant market that needed some, some new ideas, some market evolution. And unfortunately, this was kind of the, the, the spark that ignited the flame of change within the industry. And I think we're going to have a, 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 a a better functioning industry coming out of it. But of course the pain is real and, and the pain is, is definitely with us. We're seeing comic uh, retailers evolve with this as well. We're seeing curbside service. We're seeing people delivering comics with pizzas because you know uh, pizza delivery guys are considered essential because it's food. Uh, it, we, we're seeing all kinds of, of new ideas from retailers. Do you see any of these becoming permanent as well? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. Uh, I, I, I've talked a, a bit ago about the need for comic shops to change to be more of an experience uh, destination and, and, and high customer service where you're going to come in and it's not just a commodity of there's comics on a wall, you buy them, you leave. It is more uh, recommendations from shop owners, uh, attach things like pizza or like coffee or like alcohol in some states. Um, the ability for curbside, the ability to uh, kind of predictively wrap some things up for people. Uh, comic shops are going to need to evolve. And and I can say this with a lot of confidence because all retail shops are having to evolve in this area. Uh, many got it started doing this 10 years ago as a way to kind of evolve and, and comic shops largely haven't. They've stayed as they are. And so now, you know, again, we're, we're in this position where we're forced to change. But I think you will see a lot of, of you know, new smart business models. Uh, I've mentioned before, one of the things I'm doing in my new shop is I'll have art classes there where people can come in and teach uh, kids how to draw. And this is, you know, I look at this and say, hey, here's a market that's not getting tapped because uh, parents are always looking for after school programs or looking for things to put their kids in. Um, this is a way to get them into art. It's not being offered somewhere else. It's connected to comics. It's going to have an attached business. And, and those kinds of ideas, and there are dozens of them out there, uh, if not hundreds, are going to continue as shops you know, come to grips with the fact that just selling products on a shelf is, is not viable. Do you see that, that every shop, you know, comic shop in America, or most every shop should have an e-commerce uh, interface to where they can reach new customers that maybe aren't completely regional to them, or maybe customers that don't want to come into the comic shop every week? Should every comic shop have an e-commerce website now? Yeah, I, I think it needs an answer for it. I think not every comic shop needs to do e-commerce mail order or have you know a digital presence in the same way, but every comic shop should at least understand what their digital position is. 
So whether that's a website, whether that's kind of self-manage your own pull box as a customer, whether it's um, submit requests for back issues or, or actually, or do mail order to other regions. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to have a digital strategy. And the trick for comic shops is you, you can't just ignore it. Um, there are a lot of comic shops who have no, no Twitter, no Facebook, no social media presence. Uh, they kind of, they, you know, some discover for the first time they have a Yelp page. They didn't know they had one. Uh, th that, that doesn't work going forward. Those businesses are going to die maybe slowly, but it, you, you have to have at least some foot in digital in order to win. Obviously, it hasn't only uh, affected, you know, uh, distribution and retailers. There's been a, you know, you can see the change in mindset as far as creators go. I think a lot of creators were kind of dependent on being, I'm a Marvel writer or I'm a DC writer. And maybe or maybe I'm an image. I'm an image guy. I think they're seeing that maybe those aren't quite as stable as they thought they were before. And, you know, with, with convention season not being there to where maybe a lot of artists can go and, and make some money or even writers to go out there and do autographs and things like that. I see a lot of them moving away from just being Marvel or just being DC and having an independent presence to where they have a, a an interface where they can go and talk to their, their fans or customers, you know, whether it be Discord, uh, whether it be a Patreon site, something like that, YouTube channel, where they can go and talk to their customers directly and have a, a means of sustaining their life that, that isn't completely reliant on DC or Marvel moving forward. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, and we've talked about this before too, there's this perception in the industry that the pinnacle of your career was, you know, you work you work hard in the Indies, you take maybe lower paying jobs, you eventually get that job at Marvel and DC, you, you climb the ladder there, you get a big book, and then from there, maybe you get your own self. If, if you're really shooting for the moon, you get your own self owned title and Netflix buys it. And that's your, your arc as a creator. And, and what we're seeing is that there's many ways to be successful. There's not just that one way. And making it, quote unquote, to Marvel or DC is maybe, you know, has less, less support, less confidence, less stability than doing it on your own because you are the victim of having a pencils down notice or a, uh, or a furlough, you, you may, you may not get that second arc on that book. There's no guarantee. And so a lot of creators, I think, put their effort into networking to make sure that they knew the editors, that they had that relationship. They were, you know, if they were not going to get passed over for a new title or a new book. And now with no books being printed at all, all that networking um, really doesn't necessarily help them. So I think you're, you're seeing people kind of come to the conclusion of, Yes, you can you can self publish, you can crowdfund, you can make an independent thing, you can still shoot for Marvel or DC as an option. You've got a lot of different routes you can take, but there's no one single route. And the big guys do massive layoffs too, as it turns out. It's it's not the safe job, and and it's weird to me. I guess having worked with a lot of big companies uh, and friends who work in giant companies that do you know thousands of people laid off or rifts on a regular basis, it's always weird to me to hear people say. Uh, hey, you know, if I get a job at Marvel, I'm going to be set for life. It's like, oh, well, that's not the way the world works. And I think a lot of people are discovering that. You have to have your own plan. Speaking of Marvel, they had a lot of, uh, of fat on, on, their dis or on their publishing line. Comics that really just, if you look at their, their sales numbers, they didn't really justify their existence other than Marvel maybe wanted to have a comic that targeted an audience that it just wasn't reaching. I do think, you know, because we have not really heard from them, do you think that we're going to see a more streamlined Marvel and DC moving forward where the publishing line is much more interested in sales and growth rather than just having a big wide line of comics, you know, with a lot of them that really people aren't interested in? Yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're slightly different places. I think that with where DC is concerned, um, I do think that they're looking at growth um, and they're looking at they can't just – ship books out and hope for the best. And that's going to be all it takes. I think that's why you see them going into digital. You see them uh, doing more outreach. You see them uh, starting to make their plans with Warner Media and, and everything they're doing there. I think DC is is kind of aware of the fact that, that they need to uh, grow the business. And the way they grow the business is not uh, shelf stuffing. Um, where Marvel's concerned, I mean, we haven't heard from anything from them. So we don't know exactly what they're thinking. We know that uh, they piled up a bunch of comics, and that's a, maybe an ominous sign that when things back get shipping again, we're just going to get this flood of books for a while. Um, even though they stopped a bunch of titles, they were several months ahead. So there's a there's a pile of Marvel waiting to come out. 
I don't sense that Marvel's going to uh, adjust in the short term. I think what's going to force them to adjust is if DC uses this moment where they're kind of running unopposed and they're able to get a bunch of these other businesses started. Marvel's going to be in a position of trying to copy that. And, and I think you could see them do, do that. But Marvel's strategy for a very long time has been stuff the shelves, get as many, you know, suck the energy out of the room and the oxygen out of the room and, and dominate that space. And it's a, it's kind of an eighties mentality that never really grew up. Um, you know, many other companies realize that, that owning shelf space maybe isn't all it's cracked up to be, especially in our new market as a business. Um, and it, comics has, has trails. Uh, Marvel's still with empire had their, you know, 20, 30 tie-ins, whatever <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but it, it's about that. Um, you know, I, I just I don't think that's a, a viable market strategy going forward. And I think that's going to become really clear over the next 12 months. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the uh, the nonstop events, events that lead into events, overlapping events, uh, kind of dries up. But we'll have to see how Marvel's sales are, obviously, when they come back. I mean, Speaking of sales, we, we don't know what they're going to look like. We're def we, I know that we've lost some shops. How many shops do you think we are going to lose? Do, do, do you even have an idea? Yeah, I, I was having this conversation with someone else, and we were pegging it at, at we think it's it's going to be around 25% of shops are going to vanish. Um, and I, I think that, that that's in line with what people are expecting from smaller business retail right now, that this, this current event is going to see somewhere between 20 and 25%. The comic books are a little bit more exposed because a lot of these were operating um, on very lean margins. The, the question will be, it's, it's kind of two bumps. When businesses start to open up again, when product starts flowing again, um, how, you know, how much are people going to spend? I think the thing we don't know, uh, we've heard several comments. Unemployment say, is, is going through the roof. It is, exactly. And, and we've heard some people say, well, our comic business is doing better than ever. I mean, yeah, in the short term, that makes sense. People are looking for entertainment. But as belts tighten over the next six months, we do expect this economy is taking a hit and comic books for spite. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but comic books are not essential for people to survive. And I think if you're having a choice between, do I want to keep my Netflix subscription or am I going to keep buying some of these comics? You're probably going to trim your comic line. And if that happens, uh, as I'm sure it will, a lot of comic shops that are running thin on margin and just had a two month pause or three month pause on their business. It's going to make it very hard for them to, to stay alive. So I think 25% is what we're going to lose. And if the economy drags out, unemployment's high, things don't bounce back, people start to tighten their belt further, I think you're going to see further erosion. You, you could get much higher than that. I have heard the number that once the direct market falls underneath 2,000 shops, it's unsustainable. 25% of, of the current number, which I believe was is about 2,500 shops, will take it right around 1,900. So okay. under that 2,000 threshold, was that a real magic number or is that something someone made up? No, I think it's it's a rule of thumb. With business forecasting, you have to put targets somewhere. And I think losing 25% if we get there, I think it's it's a it's a huge worry for the direct market. And I think it's 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 dangerous. Now, adding uh, Midtown and um, a discount comic book service as additional uh, distributors actually helps that picture a little bit because it distributes kind of where things are going, their their existing systems. They don't have an operational capacity. Part of what went into that number was the idea that this was what would be needed for Diamond to sustain um, their operations and, and everything they've got going. But um, because Midtown, some of these others in the business of, of you know, having these capabilities already, there's not a startup cost to build these operations. I think that it, that number gets a little fuzzier. But yeah, I, mean, I think we're, we're definitely in a dangerous spot um, at that number for sure. All right, so there's another group of people associated with the industry. We don't talk about them a lot on the channels as far as their viability and thing, and that's the websites that you know that put out the news, your CBRs, your comicbook.coms, your newsaramas. So we know ad revenue, I think it's plummeted somewhere around 70%, uh, you know, as far as online ad revenue for, for pop-ups pop and clicks and all that, that stuff for, for those type of websites. I don't see them all making it through this. Do you, are we going to lose the the, the few um, websites that we do have dedicated to comic books and comic culture? Yeah, uh, we are. I think you're going to see a raid on on media through the ad business, like you're talking about, for for not just comic books but all all news. I mean, the money's just not there. And this was going on before this virus hit. By the way, I mean this was this is not necessarily new news um, that a lot of them were on shaky ground. This is going to make matters worse. 
comic book news sites, a lot of them, um, and I hope the background noise is okay, it just start raining fiercely above me. Um, comic book news sites, in many cases, were not making a lot of money. And in, in some cases, they're vanity projects for people who are getting comps of free comics in return for writing articles. So it's it's a kind of a, you know, or, you know, places like Bleeding Cool, there's some promise that, you know, you can get some free comics and you get some intros to the industry so it can become a vehicle, CBR the same way, it can be a vehicle for you actually getting to be that writer at Marvel. I mean, if you don't, CBR will promote, hey, we're going to, you know, pay, we're going to pay you at this rate, but look, Kelly Thompson's writing for Marvel right now. That could be you. I mean, I think that kind of stuff, um, trade for services will continue. And I think those, <laughs> I say this unfortunately because I think the, the more quality uh, websites are going to have a difficult time uh, continuing with revenue. And I think the ones that are maybe a little less quality that are trading, you know, uh, intros for services are going to live on, which is kind of maybe a bad outcome. All right, so the last thing we need to talk about, we don't, we do know a lot of indie creators have moved to the crowdfunding model, uh, or, or maybe even on Patreon. We've seen that Patreon is laying people off. We've seen Kickstarter is laying people off. Is this going to have a trickle down effect on those indie creators? Are they going to have less opportunities to maybe uh, self publish their comics through the crowdfunding method? Maybe they'll have to go back and compete, you know, for the indie comic uh, indie slots. Well, I, I, you know, I think it's it's kind of a mixed bag. I think that the you know crowdfunding and the ability to sell your goods there are that's going to continue. I don't think they're going to go away completely. I, I do think some of these businesses are run trying to entice VCs to to put in money, get a high valuation, to go public one day or to to get snapped up, and maybe that picture doesn't look as healthy. So we may see some of them go away. But I think the bigger factor there is, is there was an unrealistic expectation of what could happen with crowdfunding. And I was disappointed to hear, I mean, on some shows over the last week, people are still kind of, you know, describing that as, you know, sky's the limit. It's only going to grow from here. Odds are, I mean, if you just track the history of business, that's that's unlikely to happen. Generally, the, the bigger money is in the beginning and then things drop as it stabilizes. And then you see growth. I think we we're going to see a bit of that drop. I, I mean, there's as more and more projects flood into it, customers are going to get a little more discriminating about their money. And so I think this idea that, hey, look, uh, you know, CyberFrog made a million dollars. All I have to do is make something kind of like CyberFrog and I'll make a million dollars too. I, that's that's crazy talk. Uh, you, you're, you're very unlikely to, to make that money. Um, and I think we are going to see some, some things drop. So if you're a creator and you're thinking this is the, uh, you know, the new gold rush of the 1800s, I think... You need to recalibrate your thinking and just make sure you're not, you know, still go for crowdfunding, make some money, but don't extend yourself to the point that you're going to tip over. So we've kind of talked talk about a lot of uh, issues about the new normal in comic books moving forward. Comic books will never be the same again. You know, we talked about uh, distribution, retailers, creators, publishing, websites, you know, um, crowdfunding moving forward. Is there anything else that I missed or that, that you really wanted to key on before we wrap this up? I you know, no, I just think um, people shouldn't be afraid of this change. Um, a lot of people are. A lot of retailers are speaking up about it, and uh, and people are would really just love it to go back to the way it was. And, and the reality is the way it was was not that great, and it was certainly not sustainable. So some of these changes, while painful, will force some improvements in the industry we need. And I think that, you know, we'll keep our eye on it. I think uh, on your channel, on my channel, and, and our conversations, and there's a lot of people who are really watching and if you're an innovator, if you're a pioneer, if you're uh, uh, an inventor, now is a great time because there is a lot of opportunity to do some pretty amazing things. And I think that's what we should keep our eye on. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Perch. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm glad to be first show. I'm, I'm part of history. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, buddy. So yeah, if you're, if, you're on the, if you're on the Twitch and you're watching the show, this was the first time we've done one of these interviews. This will be the new normal moving forward for my channel. Maybe not everything, but most of them. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.